Now we come to 4.17.170. This is another important sutta. On a certain occasion, the Venerable Ananda was staying at Kosambi in Gosita Park. Then the Venerable Ananda addressed the monks, saying, Reverend Sirs, Your Reverence, replied those monks to the Venerable Ananda. The Venerable Ananda said, Reverend Sirs, when anyone, be it monk or nun, proclaims in my presence that he has attained arahanship, all such do so by virtue of four factors, or one of these four. What are they? Herein, Your Reverence, a monk develops vipassana contemplation, eh? preceded by samatha tranquilization. In him thus developing contemplation preceded by tranquilization is born the way. He follows along that way, makes it grow, makes much of it. In him following, developing, making much of that way, the fetters are abandoned, the lurking tendencies come to an end. Or again, your reverences, a monk develops tranquilization preceded by contemplation. In him, developing tranquilization preceded by contemplation is born the way. He follows along that way, makes it grow, makes much of it. In him, following, developing, making much of that way, the fetters are abandoned, the lurking tendencies come to an end. Yet again, your reverences, a monk develops tranquilization and contemplation together or simultaneously. In him thus developing tranquilization and contemplation together, the way is born. He follows along that way, etc. As he does so, the fetters are abandoned, the lurking tendencies come to an end. Once more, your reverences, a monk's mind is utterly moved and taken up by Dhamma. That is the time, your reverences, when his mind stands fixed in the very self or internally, settles down, becomes one-pointed, is composed. In him the way is born. He follows along that way, makes it grow, makes much of it. In him following, developing, making much of that way, the fetters are abandoned, the lurking tendencies come to an end. Indeed, your reverences, when anyone, be it monk or nun, proclaims in my presence that he has attained arahanship, all such do so by virtue of four factors, or one of these four. And that's the end of the sutta. This sutta is, was spoken by the Venerable Ananda after the Buddha's passing away. Because when the Buddha was still alive, uh, whenever the monks or nuns attained arahanhood, uh, they would come and inform the Buddha that they had attained arahanhood. So because the Buddha had passed into Parinibbana and the Venerable Ananda was considered like a, a leader of the Sangha, uh, and so uh, they would come to the Venerable Ananda. The Venerable Ananda was supposed to have lived up to about 120, the age of 120. So uh, monks and nuns, uh, they, would, they would come and inform Venerable Ananda that they had attained arahanhood. And in this sutta, Venerable Ananda says uh, that all of them, all the arahans, attain arahanhood by one of these four ways. These four ways. In other words, there are only these four ways to attain arahanhood. There is no other way eh, to attain arahanhood. The first one is a person practices samatha first, followed by vipassana. The second one, he practices vipassana first, followed by samatha. The third one is samatha and vipassana together. The fourth one is a, a method of meditation which nowadays uh, is seldom taught in Theravada Buddhism, but which has gone into Mahayana Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, and also uh, Hinduism, uh, Jnana Yoga. And that is contemplating on the self, contemplation on the self until the mind becomes one-pointed, which also means that's a samatha practice. And then after that... Uh, he follows along that way eh? and uh, the asavas are destroyed. So these are the four ways eh, to attain arahanhood. And in all these four ways, eh, we find eh, actually both samatha and vipassana are necessary. Samatha is tranquilization of the mind and vipassana is the contemplation, contemplation 
uh, of the body and the mind basically yeah. uh, so uh, if nowadays uh, people say that samatha is not necessary it is not the Buddha's teaching if people say vipassana is not necessary it's also not the Buddha's teaching both samatha and vipassana are clearly necessary uh, in this sutta now we come to uh, another important sutta there's uh, quite a lot of Good important suttas here. Four point eighteen point hundred and seventy one. The Buddha said, Monks, where there is bodily action, there arises to the self pleasure or pain caused by intention of bodily action. Or monks, where there is verbal action, there arises pleasure or pain to the self caused by intentional action of speech. Or monks, where there is mental action, there arises pleasure or pain to the self caused by intentional action of mind. Or it is due to ignorance. Monks, it is due to ignorance that either of himself one wills bodily intentions, falling on which arises to the self that pleasure or pain. Or others will bodily intentions against him, falling on which arises to the self that pleasure or pain. Either deliberately monks, one wills bodily intentions, falling on which arises to the self that pleasure or pain. Or unwittingly does he will bodily intention. Either of himself, monks, one wills verbal intentions, falling on which arises to the self that pleasure or pain, or others will verbal intention against him, falling on which arises pleasure or pain. Either deliberately, monks, one wills verbal intentions, or unwittingly does he will verbal intentions. Again, monks, either of himself, one wills mental intentions, falling on which arises to the self that pleasure pleasure or pain, or others will mental intentions against him, falling on which arises pleasure or pain. Either deliberately monks, one wills mental intentions, or unwittingly does he will mental intention. Monks, in these instances, ignorance is followed, but by the utter ceasing and ending of ignorance, that bodily intention exists not, falling on which that pleasure or pain arises to the self. That verbal intention, that mental intention exists not, following on which that pleasure or pain arises to the self. There is no field, no base, no sphere of action, no occasion, following on which that pleasure or pain arises to the self. And this uh, is one of the suttas uh, about karma. And uh, the Pali word here uh, is kaya sankarang abhisankaroti, which means wills bodily intentions. The second one is vachi sankarang abhisankaroti, which means wills verbal intentions. The third one is mano sankarang abhisankaroti, uh, which means wills mental intentions. And um, we note here that in all these instances of karma, the third one uh, is mano sankara, and uh, it is not citta sankara. In the uh, paticca samuppada, dependent origination, uh, the sankaras are mentioned as kaya sankara, vachi sankara, and citta sankara. And uh, there are two sets of sankaras we find in the suttas. One is kaya sankara, vachi sankara, mano sankara. The other one is kaya sankara, vachi sankara, and citta sankara. And uh, mano sankara is always used uh, when it, it, it concerns karma, just like this sutta concerns karma and uh, we use Mano Sankara, the third one. Whereas uh, in the Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination, it is Citta Sankara. And Citta Sankara, uh, we find, uh, has to not has to do not with Kama, but with uh, uh, cessation. Cessation. Uh, if you are interested, you can look at my book, Dependent Origination. Uh, and it it ex- explains the difference between these two sets of Sankaras. And we find it towards the end uh, that when ignorance is ended uh, with the ceasing and ending of uh, ignorance, uh, there is no more karma created. Now another sutta, 4.18.172. 
Monks, there are these four ways of getting personality. What for? There is monks, the getting of personality in the getting of which one's own intention, not that of another person, has effect. There is that in the getting of which another person's intention has effect, not one's own. There is that in which both one's own and another's intention have effect. And there is that in which neither has effect. These are make four. When this was said, the Venerable Sariputta said this to the Exalted One. Of this law that has been uttered by the Exalted One in brief, I understand the meaning in detail. In the case where there is getting of personality in which one's own intention, not another's, has effect, there is disease, there is disease for those beings from that group because of one's own intention. In the case where there is getting of personality in which another's intention, not, so, not one's own, has effect, there is disease for those beings from that group because of another's intention. In the case where there is getting of personality in which both have effect, there is disease for those beings from that group because of the intention, both of oneself and, and of another. But Lord, in the case where there is getting of personality in which neither has effect, what sort of devas are to be regarded therein? And the Buddha said, In that case, Sariputta, it is the devas who have attained the realm in which is neither perception nor non-perception. And Sariputta said, Pray, Lord, what is the reason, what is the cause, why certain beings deceasing from that group are returners, who come back to this state of things? Again, Lord, what is the reason, what is the cause, why certain beings deceasing from that group are non-returners, who come not back to this state of things? And the Buddha said, In this first case, Sariputta, in a certain person, the fetters that bind to this world are not abandoned. Such a one in this very life attains the realm where there is neither perception nor non-perception and abides therein. He enjoys its sweetness, longs for it, finds happiness therein. Established therein, given thereto, generally spending his time therein, not falling away therefrom. When he makes an end, he is reborn in that company. When he, deceases, when he deceases thence, he is a returner. He comes back to this state of things. In the other case, Sariputta, in a certain person, those fetters are abandoned. Such a one in this very life attains the realm where there is neither perception nor non-perception. He enjoys his sweetness, longs for it, etc. When he makes an end, he is reborn in that company. But deceasing thence, he is a non-returner. He comes not back to this state of things. This is the reason, this is the cause, Sariputta, why certain beings are non-returners who come not back to this state of things. The thing about this sutta, which I like to point out, is that uh, it is mentioned here that uh, there are certain persons, uh, because of their cultivation of the arupa jhana, the base of neither perception nor non-perception, uh, and they abide in it uh, constantly, uh, and they enjoy that state, uh, and constantly uh, spend their time in that state. When they pass away, uh, they are reborn in that arupa jhana realm. But there are two types of person. One is he has destroyed those fetters, uh, and uh, he does not come back to uh, the human world. Whereas there's another one who has not destroyed the fetters, he comes back to the human uh, birth again. So from here, uh, you find the one that does not come back to the human realm again. He's a non-returner, an anagami. So this is one of the few suttas uh, which shows uh, that an anagami can be reborn in the plane of neither perception nor non-perception. Usually, anagamis are reborn in the Sudavasa abode, which is the fourth jhana plane. But in this sutta, it shows that they can also be reborn in the arupa jhana plane. Now we come to another sutta, uh, which is also quite a, a, in fact, a very important sutta also. 4.18.174 the Venerable Kotita, the great Maha Kotita, came to visit the Venerable Sariputta. On coming to him, he greeted him courteously, etc., etc., and sat down at one side. So seated, the Venerable Maha Kotita said this to the Venerable Sariputta. 
your reverence or abuso, does anything at all exist after the passionless ending without remainder of the six spheres of contact? And Venerable Sariputta said, Say not that, your reverence. And then Maha Kotita the Arahan said, Then, Your Reverence, not anything exists after the ending of the six spheres of contact. And Venerable Sariputta said, Say not that, Your Reverence. And again, Venerable Maha Kotita said, Then there is, then there both is and is not anything existing after the passionless ending without remainder of the six spheres of contact. And Venerable Sariputta said, Say not that, Your Reverence. Then Venerable Mahakotita said, Your Reverence, when questioned thus, is there uh, anything remaining, or is there not, or is there and is there not, or neither is there nor is there not anything existing after the ending of the six, six spheres of contact? You reply, Say not that, Your Reverence. Pray then, how is the meaning of what I said to be regarded? And Venerable Sariputta said, Your Reverence, in saying that there is something left, one makes difficulty where there is none. In saying that there is, there neither is nor is not anything left, one makes difficulty where there is none. So long, Your Reverence, as there is going to the six spheres of contact, for just so long is there a going to difficulty. But, Your Reverence, by the passionless ending without remainder of the six spheres of contact, there is calming down of difficulty. So I'll stop here on this on this particular sutta. But I like to say about this this sutta, which is that uh, this sutta is talking about the state of nib- nibbana. You know, after the ending of the six spheres of contact is the ending of the six consciousness. The six consciousness makes up the whole world, the whole realm of existence. And when the six uh, consciousness stop. Uh, uh, that is the state of Nibbana. And here he's asking whether anything exists. And Sariputta said, don't say that. And then he said, that means nothing exists. And Sariputta said, also don't say that. And then he said, then both something exists and does not exist. And then Sariputta said, don't say that again. And neither also don't say that. So, you see, in the, in the Sutta, the, the Buddha said there are two extremes, the anni- annihilationist view and the eternalist View. If you say nothing exists uh, in the state of Parinibbana, then the Buddha said you are an annihilationist. You say nothing exists. If you say something exists, uh, then in the state of Nibbana, the Buddha said you are an eternalist. So uh, it is very dangerous uh, to say something exists and something does not exist. Uh. Um, but then uh, in the Diga Nikaya, there is a sutta where the Buddha said uh, the Tathagata is designated uh, by the Dhamma body, Dhammakaya, Brahma body, Brahmakaya, Dhamma become Dhamma Buddha, Brahma become Brahma Buddha. And uh, so the ultimate state. Uh, the Buddha didn't say that uh, nothing exists. He also didn't say that something exists. But he said that actually that the Tathagata is profound, immeasurable, unfathomable like the ocean. This is mentioned in Majima Nikaya 72. And um, this uh, ultimate state uh, which the body calls, uh, the, the Buddha calls uh, the Brahma body uh, or the Brahma become... Uh, the Hindus uh, call it Brahma and also call it Atman. And uh, I believe that those uh, holy men uh, who have reached uh, a very high level, uh, they understand uh, that this ultimate state. But they always say that it is something uh, that cannot be actually described. Uh, that's why the Buddha calls it the unconditioned, the uh, uncreate. Uh, using all uh, negative terms, you know, because it cannot be perceived by the mind, it cannot be cognized by the mind, it can only be attained. Uh, so, because this is uh, something that is, uh, uh, that uh, we cannot know unless our mind stops working. Because as long as our mind is working, uh, that means our active mind, uh, the world exists. But it's only when the active mind stops, uh, 
there is a type of consciousness uh, which the Buddha calls the unsupported consciousness in our suttas and which uh, may be similar to what the Hindus call awareness, pure awareness. Uh, but then, uh, as is mentioned in this uh, sutta, this is a very delicate uh, subject uh, and sometimes uh, people, uh, including monks, uh, and can, can come to great differences uh, and come to uh, to have uh, very strong views uh, and uh, can even split the sangha uh, when we have fixed views about this. Uh, so it's very uh, dangerous. So it's uh, best uh, if we approach this subject very carefully and uh, and uh, not to, uh, to, to, to say uh, that something exists or nothing exists. Uh, 4.18.175. The Venerable Upavana came to visit the Venerable Sariputta, etc., and said this to him. Pray, Sariputta, your reverence, is there an end maker by knowledge? Stop here for a while. End maker is antakaro. That means one who has made an end, which is basically an arahan. And then uh, Venerable Sariputta said, Not in this case, Your Reverence. And then uh, Venerable Upavana said again, Then Your Reverence, is there an end maker by conduct? Not in this case, Your Reverence. Then is there an end maker by knowledge and conduct? Not in this case, Your Reverence. What then, Your Reverence, is there an end maker by any other way than knowledge and conduct? Not in this case, Your Reverence. Sariputta, your reverence, when asked, is there any end maker by knowledge, by conduct, by knowledge and conduct, and is there any other way, you reply, not in this case, your reverence. In what way then, your reverence, is there an end maker? And Venerable Sariputta said, your reverence, if there were an end maker by knowledge, he would still be an end maker with grasping or with basis. Savu Padano. If there were one by conduct, by knowledge and conduct, he would still be an end maker with grasping. If, Your Reverence, there were an end maker by any other way than by knowledge and conduct, then the ordinary man would be an end maker. Now, Your Reverence, the ordinary man living apart from knowledge and conduct, being unversed in conduct, knows not, sees not things as they really are. But if he be practiced in conduct, he knows, he sees things as they really are. So knowing, so seeing, he is an end maker. Uh, in this sutta, uh, Venerable Sariputta says uh, that there is basically uh, no end maker, no arahan. Because if you say that there is an uh, end maker or an arahan, uh, then there would still be a basis for rebirth. Um, in other words, uh, uh, this teaching here uh, is a bit similar to some uh, teachings uh, by some Hindu saints, uh, namely that there is no person to be liberated. Uh, if we if we think that um, uh, there is a person to be liberated, uh, then we uh, uh, don't understand. Uh, that is why sometimes... Uh, uh, some people, they think that they are already an Arya and they think I have become an Arya, but uh, Arya does not think that I have become an Arya. He just knows that there is attainment and uh, he's not eager also uh, to for others to to know. Uh. Nowadays, sometimes some people think that they are Arya and they are very eager for other people to know and if other people don't accept uh, uh, don't believe uh, that they are Aryas, then they get very annoyed. Uh, and that uh, just proves uh, that they are not Arya. Uh. So here we have to know uh, basically there is nothing to attain. Uh, there is just as long as our mind is working, uh, we think there is a self, we think that the, uh, we, we, we have to strive to get out of samsara. All this uh, striving to get out of samsara is still in that uh, realm of... Uh, delusion but then um, we still have to uh, strive only thing is uh, sometimes we strive too hard uh, we don't uh, get to see things as they really are uh. one of the important qualities in the holy path is upeka equanimity uh, it's only when the mind is calm and equanimous and uh, not agitated uh, that we see things uh, as they really are uh. Today we come to Sutta number 4.18.179.
Now the Venerable Ananda went to visit the Venerable Sariputta and on coming to him greeted him courteously. As he sat at one side, the Venerable Ananda said this to the Venerable Sariputta, Pray, Sariputta, your reverence, what is the reason, what is the cause, why certain beings in this world are not fully set free in this very life? In this matter, Ananda, your reverence, beings do not understand as it really is. This perception partakes of worsening. They do not understand as it really is. This perception partakes of stability. They do not understand as it really is. This perception partakes of distinction. They do not understand as it really is. This perception partakes of penetration. This, your reverence, is the reason, this is the cause, why some beings in this world are not fully set free in this very life. And Venerable Ananda again asked, But pray, Sariputta, your reverence, what is the reason, what is the cause, why certain beings in this world are fully set free in this very life? In this matter, your reverence, beings do understand as it really is. This perception partakes of worsening. This perception partakes of distinction. This perception partakes of stability and this part perception partakes of penetration. This is the reason why certain beings are set free in this very life. Now that's the end of this sutta. Now according to uh, the Diga Nikaya Sutta number 34, eh, this sutta refers to four kinds of concentration. And this is also explained in the Visuddhi Maga. In the Visuddhi Maga, it says that... Uh, uh, of these forms of concentration, the partaking of worsening or decline is due to the frequent arising of opposing states, which means the uh, hindrances probably. Uh, then the partaking of stability is due to the persistence of that mindfulness, which is in conformity with concentration. The partaking of distinction is due to the attainment of a higher distinctive state, which probably means the jhanas, la. And the partaking of penetration is due to the promptings of perception and attention associated with disgust. That means it is more of a, a like a getting insight. So you have disgust and dispassionateness. So, uh, so from here uh, you can see uh, that um, when we uh, practice meditation, uh, we have to go through these four states. Uh, uh, the state of worsening, uh, which is the initial stage in our meditation, uh, our concentration is not stable. So sometimes it, you progress, sometimes you regress, sometimes you progress, you take one step forward and then later you take two steps back. Sometimes you take three steps forward and then you take one step back like that. Uh. So this is uh, the worsening stage. Then later uh, you come to the second stage of stability where you can get into a tranquil state uh, every time you meditate, every time you sit down, uh, you because of experience, uh, you are able uh, to bring your mind down into a tranquil state so that you can use it. Then the third one is distinction, that, you, that means you achieve a state of distinction. And this uh, should refer to uh, the jhanas, the one-pointedness of mind. In the monks' precepts, uh, there is one precept in the Parajikas, the very heaviest offenses for a monk, uh, where if a monk does not have supernormal attainments uh, and he claims uh, to have supernormal attainments, then he is Parajika, he is no more a monk. And in this uh, definition of supernormal attainments, uh, one is Arya stages, uh, that means he's not an Arya, he claims to be an Arya. Second one, uh, he does not have psychic power, he claims to have psychic power. Another one is he does not have jhana and he claims to have jhana. That means he purposely, willfully uh, lies. Uh, so, so because of that uh, definition of supernormal states, uh, so... Uh, 
jhanas uh, is a state of uh, supernormal attainment, uh, a state of distinction. That's why here uh, it should refer to the jhanas. Uh. And then uh, the, the last one is uh, the perception of this uh, penetration. Uh, that means uh, he uh, gets insight uh, as a result of the uh, one-pointedness of mind. So we have to go through these four states uh, to get liberation in this very life. So here you can see uh, the importance of both samatha and vipassana in the liberation of a person.